Okay, so here we are. I'm Rabbi Avram Golder from goldhardschool.com, home of big picture Jewish education. The Gold Goldhard School is kind of give a framework and context and uh, a sense of how things fit together because it's very daunting when you take on Jewish learning and there's so much to learn and it's 3,000 years thick of knowledge. So how do you begin? How do you stay on course? How do you know where you're going? So the goal is to provide a big picture education. And clearly when it comes to the Jewish holidays, I think it's especially uh, important to have a big picture because we could tackle each holiday on its own and talk about matzah and the Seder at Passover and what we do at Sukkot with the going into a sukkah and the four species that we bring into it. And we could talk about each one individually, but a lot of times people don't get a sense of how the entire calendar year is a remarkable spiritual journey and that the uh, holidays fit together uh, with a very clear sense of mission and purpose that the Jewish people are meant to understand and grow from year after year. So the goal of tonight is to go through all the Jewish holidays, but instead of, getting, instead of going to each one individually and talking about the customs and the, the mitzvot, the commandments we do for each one, we're going to take a step back and we're going to see the overall picture. So by the end of this evening, you're going to see understand all the different types of holidays we have, where they fit within the Jewish calendar year, and some very profound notions that Jewish people have in terms of what's happening as we travel through time and through history together. 3,300 years is a long time, and the holidays have really been our anchor. So here we're going to go. So I'm going to switch to the presentation. Here we are, ta-da, the crash course on Jewish holidays. Again, I'm Rabbi Avram Goldar. I do want to begin my thanking Project Inspire for inviting me to participate this week in their, uh, in their series. Tomorrow we will be addressing uh, spirituality, the big picture on spirituality. So here we go. So the first thing to understand about the holidays is to take a step back and look at time itself and how the Jewish people understand time. And there's really two different concepts of time, and this is important to understand the fundamentals of our holidays and our calendar system. So there's the Western notion of time and there's the Jewish notion of time. The Western notion of time is that time is linear. It's moving along. Every day there's a puff of new time that we're living in. Here we are in June 2020. But with the Western notion of time, every day is new. And it really has no connection to the past. Of course, it's come from the past and what happened in the past brought about today, but what happens today on today's date has no bearing on June of 2020 or 2016 to 1816 to, you know, the year 200, because today is completely new. It's completely fresh and it's unencumbered by the past in a way, although it is a, ra a result of what's happened in the past. It's a new period of time. The Jewish notion of time is not that it's linear. The Jewish notion of time, and therefore I just want to point out the holidays, have no intrinsic relationship to the past. I Meaning when we celebrate a holiday, Independence Day, so July 4th in this country, we celebrate, um, but the July 4th of 2020 has no intrinsic relationship because it's just a day in the past. Yes, they share the same time in the calendar, but there's nothing connecting the two events of this year's July 4th and the 2000, July 2004 of many years ago together. The Jewish notion of time is very different. Jewish notion of time is that time is cyclical. It's actually revolving around uh, in kind of a circular way, but instead of a complete circle where we'd be actually be bumping into the past when we got to a full year's period of time, it spirals upwards, it spirals. So it's going around in a cycle and it's spiraling upwards. And therefore there's points on this calendar year, there's, there's points within the calendar year which are resonating as we hit those points of time. So if you can imagine looking down here that we have Passover, the moment when the Jewish people were freed from so many years of servitude and we experienced freedom as a nation. Well, that breakthrough moment in our nationhood, that moment created a spiritual light and that spiritual light, you can imagine, traverses every year. So every time we hit those seven days or eight days of Passover, that we celebrate in our calendar year, we are actually touching that moment again. It's like the inverse of 
let's see, go to Florida. I go to Florida for the winter, let's say. So if I go to Florida, I've been to Florida before. So the palm trees are the same and the beach is the same and many of the hotels are the same, but it's a different year. So I enter a certain space that's very familiar and real and creates an impression on me, but the year has changed. So in the Jewish calendar year, it's sort of like the same thing where we're entering a period of time, which is the same, it's the same environment. And therefore the potential for spiritual growth that existed at its root at certain events in, the, in Jewish history, those events shed a light, kind of shine a light throughout every year. And therefore, when we go through the calendar year, we're actually hitting those moments of time. And therefore, our holidays derive a holiness from the past that, and meet the present. So the present is connecting to the past. And that's why on many of our holidays, we cease doing work. We kind of pull back from the, the nine to five and we enter a unique period that has rooted and anchored with certain mitzvot that give us a taste and an access to that reality. So when we enter Passover again and we're eating our matzah and recalling the Exodus, we're not just thinking about what happened many years ago, 3,000 years ago, but we're actually getting in touch with the light and the potential, the same way it was realized then, that potential exists for us. And the access into it is through the very mitzvot, the various commandments we do on that holiday. And that's why we pull back, because we're no longer in the year 2020 in a typical way. We're now hitting that moment again. And therefore, that's the notion of the Jewish year. And you can see this reflected, very interesting, in the name year. Because in Hebrew, the word for year is shana. And shana means to repeat. Mishno means to repeat something to go over and over again. It also means, interesting, a shinui means to a change. So here you have in the year, on one hand, a repetition of a cycle. At the same time, there's always an element of change. And therefore, the Jewish people every year, being that we're different, we have to access and grow in our unique way to contribute to what the Jewish people are trying to accomplish as we traverse through history. It also, by the way, means old. Shana min yashan means old because it's something very old and familiar. We've been there before. So that's very interesting. Happens to be that the month in Hebrew is called a chodesh. And chodesh comes from the root new. Chadash is new. So every month there's a newness that breaks out, a new connection. That's why when you begin to observe the Jewish holidays, you get tied into the months in a much more uh, uh, fundamental way. Every month has a certain personality because it brings something very new and fresh. So that's the balance. And therefore, in terms of the holidays, we have different names for them. For example, we call holidays Moadim, a Moed. A Moed literally means a meeting point. Because here we are, when we enter this period of time, we're meeting once again with this great occasion, whether it's the freedom from Egypt, whether it's standing by Mount Sinai and getting the, the Torah or going through the desert, as we'll see. So we're meeting back. These meeting points are very special. And that's why we have to focus ourselves and prepare and to get the most out about what's about, what's about to occur. It's also called the Yom Tov, a good day. Uh, it's also called the Chag. We say Chag Sameach, which have a happy holiday, a festival. It's a celebration. And we also call them uh, a regal. A regal, in Hebrew, it means a leg, but it, it's a, the regalim is a pilgrimage. And that's because there are certain holidays, not all of them, but there are certain holidays that we make a pilgrimage up to Jerusalem. If we were to live, all be in Israel, we'd be making a pilgrimage, pilgrimage three times a year to the Holy Temple of Jerusalem to celebrate certain holidays all together en masse because they're national moments of joy and celebration and transformation. So therefore we have different names. Again, we call them Moadim, a Moed, a Yom Tov, a Chag, and a Regal, the Regalim. Now, how does our calendar work? So we've now understood that it's a secular, secular spiral kind of movement through time, but there's different ways calendars work. We have the solar calendar, which is the uh, planet's Earth revolution around the sun. And we know that's 365 days. And the solar calendar defines the seasons. That's a solar calendar. Then there's the lunar calendar. The lunar calendar is the 12 revolutions of the moon around the Earth every year. And that's 354 days. And it has no relationship to seasons. A month has no connection to the seasons. It's the solar calendar that has a connection to seasons. Now, in terms of how our calendar works. Well, first of all, the solar calendar is how the Christian calendar works. They go by the solar year. So 
Therefore, every year when you get back to September, so you know you're going to be hitting the fall because the solar calendar is consistent. The seasons are going to stay the same because they work according to the solar calendar. The lunar calendar is how the Muslims uh, mark their time, track their time. And that's why, if you've wondered, when the Muslims celebrate the, the month of Ramadan, which is the month of fasting, so Ramadan, that month, can be sometimes in the heat of summer, and sometimes it can be, you know, it'll be in the spring, and sometimes it'll be in the winter, or sometimes in the fall. And the reason is because if you look, the, so, the lunar calendar is 11 days less than the solar calendar. And therefore, every year in the lunar calendar, Ramadan, for the Muslims, would be occurring 11 days earlier. So every three, year, every three years, 33, day, 33, year, 33 days would get earlier, and there would be a month earlier, three years, and then another three years would be another month earlier. So it's going to move throughout the year because, again, their holidays are not rooted in the solar calendar. It's a lunar calendar. So how did the Jewish people work? Well, our calendar is lunisolar, which means it works both according to the, the uh, moon's revolutions around the earth. We mark a year by 12 revolutions of the moon around the earth. So it's a lunar calendar. Each month is 29 and a half days, meaning the amount of time it takes for the moon to revolve around the earth is exactly 29 and a half days. 29 and a half. Now, being that we don't start a new month in the middle of a day, so what do we do? So we have in our tradition a way to adjust the calendar that certain months will make just 29 days and certain months will be 30 days. We'll make a two-day Rosh Chodesh, a two-day new month to start of the, of the month. But we'll flip it. But that's the way our month works. It goes according to the lunar calendar. That's the exact time. Uh, and therefore, it's 29 or 30 days. But it's lunar solar, which means it has a connection to the solar calendar as well. Because the Torah commands us that our holidays must be at their proper season. So Passover, we're told, must be in the spring, celebrating the spring. And the holiday of Sukkot must be in the autumn. Well, what are we going to do? How are we going to make sure that our, our holidays are at the same time if we go by the lunar calendar? So what we do is we actually adjust the calendar with a leap year. Now, what we'll do is if we went with the solar calendar, imagine three years pass, and now Passover be 33 days prior to where it was in the previous, you know, three years earlier. So what we'll do is we'll add a month to our calendar. We'll make it a 13-month year, and then Passover will pop back and it'll stay in the spring. So we actually balance the two calendars, and every number of years we're going to always add another month to our calendar to ensure that the holidays fit the time of year they're in. And the reason why, there's this um, stress to do so. Uh, my seven times in 19 years will do this uh, because in our tradition, each season is a physical manifestation of a spiritual reality. Meaning, our holidays are not perceived as things that just happen to be when they are, but rather what's happening in the physical world is a manifestation of a spiritual reality. Therefore, Passover, which is a time of tremendous freedom and breakthrough, that's spring. Springtime is a time when things are, you know, breaking through and it's fresh and it's new. And that ambiance and that culture and that sense of where we are in the year in terms of the climate contributes to the spiritual light that's coming through at Passover time. And the same thing at Sukkot. Sukkot's the autumn when everything's starting to uh, fall, the leaves are falling, it's harvest time, it's the end of the year. That sense of harvest and satisfaction is connected to our holiday cycle and what we're trying to accomplish at the holiday of Sukkot. So once again, our calendar, the Jewish calendar, is luni solar. The Christians, solar. The Muslims, lunar. And we have this balance between the two where we're adjusting the lunar year to make sure it fits the solar year. So I don't want to get too technical here, but I think it's very important. That's why you wonder, sometimes we'll have what's called a second Adar. We'll take the last month of the year, which is called Adar in Hebrew, and we'll make it another month. We'll add another Adar. And that's how we balance to make sure that what's happening around us reflects what's happening spiritually within us. Okay, now, how many Jewish holidays are there in a year? So I'm going to put up a number, a bunch of numbers here, although I, you know, so many. And I've asked this question in seminars and groups, and it's very interesting. 
that uh, people often say 15, 20, I've had up to 60. Uh, and people often say to me, who aren't necessarily um, following the Jewish calendar, that they just feel like every month or every week there's another there's a holiday happening. And it's seven days, and eight days, and this holiday, and that holiday. We have a lot of holidays. So how many holidays do we actually have within the year? Well, a grand total of just 12. Just 12, which is going to make this crash course in Jewish holidays very manageable. And this is the way it's going to work. Of those 12 holidays, we have five biblical holidays. A biblical holiday means that it's commanded in our Torah. And the, the Torah tells us we must observe these days. And the key here is we aren't designing the holiday. The Almighty God is telling the Jewish people, this day is a holy day, it's a mode, it's special. This is what must be observed, and this is the way to observe it. So biblical holidays are mandated by God, right? And we're not coming up with them. And therefore, that's why we say that these days have a spiritual light that traverses through history, because who are we to be able to know, you know, if uh, something happened, whether that event is so significant it reverberates throughout history or not. But when the Almighty commands it, it's because there's something existential that's happened at that time that we're meant to tap into every year. So we have five biblical holidays, which we're going to go through. And then we have seven rabbinic days. Seven rabbinic days. The rabbis, after a certain period of time, after the Torah was given, throughout history, which we're going to talk about, they instituted certain days that we must observe. Of them, five of them are fast days. Like fast days are days... To uh, typically when we have to do some spiritual reflection because we've gone off course. And therefore, a fast is meant to sort of bring in our physical appetites and our, our physical nature and kind of tether it a little bit so it's not controlling us to allow our spiritual sense and a sense of responsibility and focus on life's purpose to have more of our attention. And therefore, we have five different fast days within the Jewish year that are rabbinic. And we're going to have two celebrations, two holidays that the rabbis determined that uh, we should celebrate in addition to the five biblical holidays. So very simply, we have 12 Jewish holidays through the course of the year. Five are biblical, seven are rabbinic. Of the seven of the rabbinic, five are fast days, and two are celebrations. And this is the way we're going to craft and understand what we're, what's happening throughout the course of the year. And you're going to see now how they all fit together, because Again, as I mentioned at the beginning, that it's very easy to like, oh, I love Passover and I love getting together with family, eating the matzah and, and, not, and crying when I have my maror. Or I like the holiday of Hanukkah and lighting the candles and it's a very sweet time. True, each holiday has such a different ambiance and sense about it and focus. But the reality is that in the Jewish year, it's not in any way random, but rather it's a real journey that all fits together. So let's now take a look to see how we can understand them. So we'll start with the Torah-based holidays. And again, remember, Torah-based holidays are holidays where the Almighty is telling us these days you must observe. So I think you'll find this quite fascinating. We have three festivals. Now, a festival means that there are three holidays which are national celebrations because of things that happened to us. It's called a Chag, a festival. And this is when we would typically make the pilgrimage to Jerusalem to celebrate these national holidays. And these festivals, the goal of them is to bring us back to three transformative, three transformative moments in our history. Three transformative that, that change us as who we are as a people and our sense of our own identity. So there are three environments that we went through nationally. And this is all, again, they're biblical. So this is where we were in the Torah when they're given to us. The first place that transformed us was the land of Egypt, our experience uh, being in Egypt and then getting out of Egypt, our freedom from Egypt. Of course, that's marked by the holiday of Passover. That's the first major transmission, trans, uh, uh, transformational point in our history, change us. Then we have Mount Sinai. And the holiday that brings us back to the foot of Mount Sinai, when we had national revelation, when the Torah was given to the Jewish people on mass and the Ten Commandments were spoken, is the holiday of Shavuot. So Shavuot brings us back to Mount Sinai. And then the third place that transformed us, again, this is while we're journeying through it in the Bible's story within the Bible, is we're in the desert. And the holiday that marks our journey through the desert is the holiday of Sukkot. The holiday of Sukkot, which brings us back to that time. Each one of these holidays has 
a notion about it, right? They strengthen our national identity around three pillars. For Egypt, it's all about freedom, right? The idea that one can't really live, or one, better said, one's not really alive unless you're free, unless you realize that you're not, you're not held back by yesterday. And therefore, here the Jewish people were in Egypt for 210 years, much of that time was in slavery, generation after generation after generation, in a world that knew slavery and masters, and that's the way it was, there wasn't a national notion of a, uh, emancipation, a, a nation becoming free. And yet that's what happened to us. And therefore the holiday of um, Passover ties us in to the very notion of freedom, the freedom of will, our choices are free, we are free, and no matter who we think we've been in the past, it doesn't determine today at all. And that's the goal of the holiday of Passover. Shavuot focuses on the giving of the Torah and our receiving the Torah. The fact that beyond what we can perceive with our senses, with our eyes, what we can smell, what we can hear, we have something beyond nature that was given to us that gives us the code, the, the meaning behind the reality that we're in and our sense of purpose. And that bound us the, together with God as we became his nation. So that capacity to be so open to something that's so far beyond anything that we've, we know from this world, having that openness and the willingness to delve into it and to explore it and to connect to each other and to the Almighty through it, that's the holiday of Shavuot. That brings us back to the foot of Mount Sinai where we had national revelation. And the holiday of Sukkot, the theme, we actually call it Zman Sim Chaseno, the time of our happiness, the time of Sukkot ties us in most deeply to our sense of satisfaction of being in this world. As I said earlier, Sukkot's always tied into the fall, the harvest season. When you harvest, you have a great sense of satisfaction. All your work, all your investment has been now realized in the bounty that you're bringing home. To my, a time of tremendous satisfaction. But instead of taking all that physical wealth and feeling, okay, now I'm secure because I've got my you know, money in the bank, the reality is with the Jewish people, is we go out into our little booths our Sukkot, which is the way the Jews lived in the desert. And the, and the, the primary halacha, the primary law of a Sukkah is it has to be thatched. The roof has to be thatched. So you should be able to see through it, through the, to the stars in the sky. And the idea of a Sukkot is that our sense of real security comes from not what we have and the roof we put over our head, but it's the fact that we know we're living in the Almighty's world. And he's the one who's providing us protection. We live miraculously in the desert for 40 years, a wilderness, that really doesn't support life as we know it, especially humans, and yet we survived for 40 years in the desert, and we've survived for 3,300 years of Jewish history, and clearly a lot of time without the security of a roof over our head, but we're still around because we know that we're here for a reason, and we have a special connection, and the Almighty is protecting us. That's the holiday Sukkot. That's real happiness, because every deep down is looking for security. The great security is to know that your very existence is being watched and protected and uh, guided. So those are the three festivals. Again, they take us back to the experience of Egypt, Mount Sinai, and the desert, and tie us into notions that are very important as we keep moving forward. Then we have two high holidays to complete the five Torah-based holidays. The two high holidays, we know, are Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. Now, in Hebrew, they're called the Yom Nim Naraim, the days of awe, because these days are actually awesome days. They're not national events that we're celebrating together on mass, but rather they bring us back to even a deeper sense of our own reality. Rosh Hashanah is the beginning of the new year. It literally means the head of the year. It's what we celebrate by blowing the shofar and going to shul and proclaiming the Almighty as our king as we start a whole new year. Now, Rosh Hashanah is also the anniversary, in our tradition we understand, as the creation of man. Adam was created, Adam was created on that day of Rosh Hashanah. The sixth day of creation is the day that he came into being. And therefore, we celebrate the new year as the anniversary of the creation of our species, the human species. And therefore, we know that Rosh Hashanah is also linked and tied into the theme of judgment. It's a time that we're being judged on who we are, what we become, as we're about to go into a new year. And therefore, what more fitting day would be a day to be judged is the day that we are actually brought into being as a species, and then we're judged in terms of what was expected and hoped for from us, 
and in terms of what we're actually accomplishing. So it's a very intense time, but each one of us individually is being judged in terms of what's going to determine the course of our upcoming year. So it's a very intense day. It's very different than a festival, which is a national celebration. Then, Rosh Hashanah, we go to Yom Kippur, which is 10 days later. And Yom Kippur is the Day of Atonement. Now, a Day of Atonement, actually the anniversary for the, uh, the Yom Kippur is the anniversary of the sin of the golden calf. Very briefly, when we got the Torah of Mount Sinai, we were commanded, among other things, not to have any other gods beside the Almighty, right? We believe in one God, no other. And yet, 40 days after the giving of the Torah, certain events, the Jewish people failed that, and they created this calf when their leader Moses had not arrived when he had come down from the mountain, and they created this golden calf, and they said, this is the God that took us out of Egypt, and it was a terrible calamity in our history, and it took 80 days to finally get atonement for that sin, and atonement means the Almighty created the spiritual power that whatever sins you do, even though sin and mistakes create you know, a, um, an impact, a real impact and reality on us, which is negative. Just like when someone eats a lot of, you know, greasy foods, it creates a impact on who we are physically. When one does wrong, it creates a spiritual impact on who we are spiritually. Atonement actually wipes away that, uh, wipes away that sin. And therefore the Yom Kippur comes 10 days after uh, Yom Kippur. And the days in between are known as the 10 days of repentance. Days each one of us can look at ourselves, sort of kind of look in the mirror, see who we are, and reflect on the, the previous year and address mistakes we've made to others, to the Almighty, and, um, and to ourselves, and character flaws that are persisting that we could get rid of. And it's a very, very, very spiritual time, Rosh Hashanah to Yom Kippur, these 10 days of repentance, which the climax is Yom Kippur, when we get atonement, when we start the new year, with a, a sense of spiritual uh, purity and freshness as we go in unencumbered by whatever has been built up over the course of the year. So those are the five Torah-based holidays. Just again, the three festivals take us back to the past. They strengthen our national in- and identity by anchoring us again, giving us this connection to our root experiences. And our holidays are what we need to prepare us as we go into the new year. So if you can imagine that we, the Jewish people, on one hand, we need to be reminded of where we've come from as a nation, but then each one of us individually through the high holidays has to take ownership of the mistakes we made and get rid of them so that we can move into the Jewish future uh, with much more potential and strength. So that's the biblical picture. And therefore, I think you can marvel at the fact the Almighty gave us a system that's very deep, profound, and all-encompassing in terms of what we're meant to accomplish. Those are the five Torah-based holidays. Now, uh, they strengthen our individual accountability. Okay, now, the seven rabbinic holidays. So we mentioned there are five fast days and two celebrations. So we're going to talk about the five fast days first, and they can be divided into two sections. Three of the fast days are related to the Temple of Jerusalem. Now, remember, biblical holidays were relate to the Jewish people as we were in the Torah. In the Torah, we had not yet entered the land of Israel. So now imagine we come into the land of Israel. Joshua, the great student of Moses, takes us in. And during that period of time, we, in, into, after 350-something years, we end up building this temple of Jerusalem, a home for the Almighty to be in our midst. Prior to that, we had a tabernacle where the Almighty lived in our midst as we journeyed through the desert. When we came into the land, it went through a sort of an evolution. And finally, King David uh, said that it's not fitting that here he is in his palace, and the Almighty doesn't have a permanent place. And he's the one, King David, to select Jerusalem as the city, the capital city of the Jewish people, and the one to envision building a temple for God. He was not allowed to build it because he was a man of war. And God said that as much as you want to build it, your son is going to build it. You're not able to build it. And his son, Shlomo, Solomon, which means shalom, peace, a man of peace, he's the one to build the temple. So the temple of Jerusalem became the centerpiece of the land of Israel and the spiritual focus for the Jewish people. And we had it the first time for 410 years, the one that Solomon built. Uh, Unfortunately, even though it was the heights of uh, spiritual growth and uh, development that we had a place where, so to speak, the Almighty was 
dwelling in our midst in Jerusalem, the capital of the Jewish people, uh, unfortunately, we took who we were and all the blessings that had been conferred on us as God's uh, chosen nation, and we ended up becoming slack. And uh, prophets who lived during that time warned us that if we don't change our ways, we're going to lose the Temple of Jerusalem, which was very hard for us to imagine. We had it, again, for four and ten years. Hard to imagine something so permanent could, uh, could fall to ruin. But that's exactly what happened in stages. So we have in the Jewish month of Teves, which typically falls on January, the 10th of that month, that's when the siege began by the Babylonians. The first temple was sieged by the Babylonians, and that was a shock to our system. Now, anytime something bad happens to the Jewish people, it's a message, we understand, God to us to, like, wake up. Unfortunately, we didn't wake up to what this meant and the fact that we really had to take what the prophets were saying seriously. And then, unfortunately, 18 years later, the walls were breached. Uh, the walls were breached um, on the 17th of Tammuz. Now, well, we'll talk more about the, uh, the 17th of Tammuz. Other things happened on that day. It happened to be the day, the anniversary, that the Jewish people made the golden calf. So it had already um, a faulty foundation for us Jewishly. But the walls were breached and broke through. And eventually, in the ninth day of Av, Tisha B'av, that's when the temple was destroyed. Now, you see here I wrote temples because actually when the first temple was built, uh, destroyed, we went to exile to Babylon for 70 years. We came back, eventually we rebuilt it. We had it for the second temple. It was around for 420 years. And again, that was destroyed on the ninth day of Av Tisha B'av. And it happens to be many terrible calamities have occurred to the Jewish people on the ninth day of Av. The root of this day, why this day and the Jewish calendar is the day when such destruction has happened to us, is this the day the Jewish people rejected going into the land of Israel. Going back to the Torah, when the Jews were on their way in or heading towards Israel, they wanted to send in spies to see what kind of land it was, who's living there, is it well fortified. They sent in 12 spies, uh, one representing each tribe. They came back, 10 of the spies gave a negative report. Two of them gave a positive report, but they said, listen, it's a great land and very fertile, but there's giants living there. We're going to get you know, crushed in war and decimated. And the Jewish people lost hope. And they cried all night. And God said to them, on this day, the ninth day of Av, you cried over nothing. Therefore, in the future, I'm going to give you something to cry about on this day. And the ninth day of Av, Tisha B'av, is a very intense fast day. These two fast days are a half-day fast. I mean, we start fasting in the morning till sunset. The ninth day of Av is a full-day fast, just like Yom Kippur is a full-day fast. It starts at nightfall one night, and then it finishes uh, the next day when night falls again. Same with the, the ninth of Av. Now, those are the three fast related to the temple. The siege of Jerusalem, when the walls get breached and the temple is destroyed. The 17th of Tammuz is referring to the, when the Romans breached the walls in the second temple. They're the ones who destroyed the second temple. Babylonians the first, Romans the second. There are two more fast days. The fast days, uh, excuse me, two more fast days relate to exile. The first was called Som Gedalia. Som Gedalia. Now, who is Gedalia? Well, when the Jewish people were led into exile after the first temple was destroyed by the Babylonians down into Babylon, there was a small remnant of Jews that still lived in Israel. And the Babylonians appointed a governor, a Jewish governor over them. His name was Gedalia. Well, it's a bit of a story, but uh, the Jewish people were obviously um, forlorn. Here they are lost. The great Jewish people are civilization that we had celebrated for so many centuries in the land of Israel, 850 years from the time we entered the land to the destruction of the temple. So it was a very difficult time. And there was a group of Jews that felt that uh, it was better to join up with the uh, Egyptians. And uh, anyway, they assassinated the governor, this the governor Gedalia. And um, it was a uh, terrible day, uh, of course. And then the Jews, uh, the Babylonians, of course, would be, you know, incensed that Jews had killed the governor that they had appointed over the land. And uh, they'd gone to a, um, the prophet Jeremiah, who lived at that time, and said, listen, give us guidance. And uh, go to God and ask what we should do now. Like, and they ended up, um, they ended up uh, uh, Jeremiah comes back, and he tells them, God says, stay here, no problems. And uh, anyway, the Jewish people lose hope. 
And it was a very difficult time. They decided they're going to go to Egypt uh, for safety. They're told it's not going to happen. They're not going to get safety in that land. And, uh, but they do, and they end up leaving, and destruction occurs uh, further on. But the idea of this fast and exile is that when the Jews are in exile, it's a very strange situation for us, because here we are, God's people in the land of Israel, height of civilization, and now we have to accept at times the fact that we've done wrong, and we have to accept our station where we're at at this point of time. And that's what we fail to learn from through this fast. And it's a fast day. Then we also have the, what's fast called the fast of Esther, Tinus Esther. That occurs when we were uh, living in the land of Persia. So when Babylon gets conquered uh, by uh, the Persians, the Jews are under their rule, and we have a different type of challenge. One challenge of the Jewish people, as we experience with Gedalia, is we just don't want to accept someone else's rule over us. Here in Persia, eventually the Persians are ruled by a king named Ahasuerus, and uh, he throws this massive party to celebrate his uh, rule. And the fact that the Jewish people, it looks like they're not going back to Israel. Seventy years have passed, and they were told by the prophet Jeremiah that they'd be going back after 70 years. This king, Ahasuerus, miscounts, but he makes a big celebration, and he makes, makes a massive party displaying all his wealth. And the Jews, many Jews go, even though they're not to go. And there's another mistake Jews make when we're in exile, which is, we compromise our values at times, thinking that if we can get our non-Jewish host nation to like us and we can show them that we'll, we'll, um, we'll bend and compromise ourselves to their whims, then somehow that'll gain their liking and favor. And the reality is that's never so, and it's never worked. So we have the holiday, which we're going to talk about, the holiday of Purim, but there's a fast day right before the holiday of Purim, which we celebrate the, the victory over this uh, at this time, and it's the fast of Esther. So Gedalia is exile where we don't accept our place in exile and we fight against our rulers. Uh, the fast of Esther is the mistake we make when we compromise who we are to try to gain favor over the people ruling us. Then we have two celebrations. We have Purim and we have Hanukkah. So Purim occurred first in the Jewish calendar, Jewish history. Again, we were ruled by the Persians at this time. Hanukkah ruled by the Greeks. And the fascinating thing is just to contrast the two, because you'll see when the rabbis set these two celebrations, why they end up becoming very important anchors, holidays for us to maintain while we're traveling through history and much of it in exile. So by Purim time, we have a physical threat of genocide. We have an uh, advisor to the king, uh, his name was Haman, to, to King Akashverosh, and uh, he's risen to power and there's a whole story. Uh, he's uh, upset that uh, Jewish leader Mordechai is not uh, bowing down to him and uh, wants to take it out on the entire Jewish people. And there's a threat. He gets the king's uh, acceptance to, to commit mass genocide against the Jewish people at a certain time. And uh, where Hanukkah is a time where there's a spiritual threat of assimilation. Here, when we were ruled by the Greeks um, after the period of Persians, the uh, issue was not a uh, physical threat, but rather Greek culture was a very powerful culture. And it was really the first time that the Jewish people ever met another nation that was similar in certain respects. They had a tremendous respect for wisdom and scholarly people. They wanted to understand the world. It was a, uh, a thinking people. Before that, you had Ammonites, Moabites, Edomites. You know, no one wants to be like them, but the Greeks were actually very appealing. Uh, there was beauty, of course, the arts. And uh, unfortunately, many Jews uh, assimilated and they, they became Hellenized Jews, Jews that became proponents of Greek culture. And then now there was a spiritual threat of assimilation. So it's a very different type of background to the holiday. In Purim, we prayed for our deliverance. We didn't fight, we, uh, at least initially. Uh, it was really through that fast day that we've spoken about over here. It was a time to really pray for the Almighty to help us uh, at that time, where the Greeks, we went to war. Because when there's a spiritual threat, it's very hard and very subtle. And therefore, we responded. And there's a famous war against the Greeks led by a Jewish priest named Matisiel and his sons. His fam most famous son was Judah, Judah the Maccabee. Maccabee is Hebrew for a uh, Greek for hammer, but also means, comes from the word Mika, the verse, Mika Mocha Be'elimashim, who is like you, powerful one God. And this small band of guerrillas, you know, led a war against the great Greek army. And we have the celebration. Purim, we actually had a hidden miracle. 
the hidden miracle that, that saved us in Purim time is that advisor to the king. Uh, at one point, the king at his party gets so drunk, he asks his queen, Vashi, to come out to the party not dressed and to show her off to all, his, uh, all the other leaders of the different nations there. And she refuses. He has her executed. And then there's a beauty contest to select a new queen. And lo and behold, a Jewish girl, Esther, is chosen. She doesn't reveal her identity as per the uh, counsel of her uncle, Mordecai, who was the leader of the Jewish people. And through a whole set of circumstances that happens over the course of the year, she ends up revealing her identity at the right time. And uh, things turn, the tables turn on Haman, and uh, he is uh, executed. And it was a hidden miracle. There you don't see God's hand outright. Uh, it was really circumstances. As they moved along, we saw God's hand in things, but it was very hidden. And then we, re- we celebrate that by reading the, the Megillah, the story of the Purim story, and we celebrate that, and we celebrate the day, the very joyous day with, uh, with meals and decorate with uh, costumes because we recognize that things aren't as they appear in life. Hanukkah was a revealed miracle because not only did we win the war against a massive Greek army, but when we went to reclaim our temple, which the Greeks had overrun and made a uh, uh, place where they would worship their deities and offer pigs, we ended up rededicating the temple. And part of that dedication was finding a flask of oil to light the menorah, the candelabra that was part of the, the temple service. And they found enough oil to last for one day and it lasted for eight days, uh, miraculously. And that was a, a sense of God's presence here in the midst. And just like the, the little bit of the light can dispel a lot of darkness, so too the light that came from the Jews who were connected to the tradition and fought back against the assimilation, they fought back a lot of darkness that was brought upon them by the Greeks and their culture. So it's a very different day. So you can now see what the rabbis sought to help us accomplish. Again, it evolved over time, but in terms of where our spiritual perspective and need focus needs to be, we have three days that we have to focus on the loss of the temple and not getting the message, the siege, the walls being breached, the temples destroyed, how we are in exile. Sometimes we're unbending. We don't accept the fact that there's that we've been diminished because of our, our sins and our national failings. Other times we compromise our values. It's a balance. And then we have these two great celebrations and these two de- holidays, Purim and Hanukkah, keep us focused in different ways by the challenges that we meet as we go through exile uh, that we're still in. Even though we have the land of Israel, uh, much of the Jewish people still live in the diaspora and we haven't fully come home yet. We haven't realized our true uh, national potential, spiritual potential, as a uh, one collective people. So we celebrate Purim with a meal, and Hanukkah we celebrate with prayer. Most of it's not, there's no festival, there's no uh, holiday meal per se, although we have latkes, and greasy foods, but we celebrate more by prayer and giving thanks to the Almighty. So now, to finish it up, I want to just to go and identify how the calendar is organized the 12 months of the year. So we have the first six months of the year and the next six months of the year. Now, the fascinating thing is that where Rosh Hashanah is the beginning of the new year, the first month in the Jewish calendar is not the month that we celebrate Rosh Hashanah. Rosh Hashanah is actually celebrating the seventh month of the year. I know it's a bit of a head scratcher, but the first month of the year actually is the month of Nisan, is the month that we got out of Egypt. And in fact, the first commandment given to the Jewish people was to keep the calendar, to watch uh, the calendar year by, according to the months, and therefore, this month was called the first of months. And that's the, when we got it out. So here, just in terms of the breakdown, that's the spring months. Month one, two, three, four, five, six are the summer months. Seven, eight, nine are the fall months. And 10, 11, 12 are the winter months. Now let's organize the holidays in. So the first month of the year, which is usually March, sometimes in April, because again, because it floats a little bit with our lunar solar calendar, we have Passover. That's in the first month. 50 days after getting out of Egypt, the Jews were standing at the foot of Mount Sinai, and that's when we got the Torah, and that's when we have the holiday of Shavuot. So Shavuot is always 50 days after Passover, so that's in the third month. So this is, you know, uh, typically in May, sometimes in, uh, sometimes it could be in June, I believe, but it's 50 days after Passover. Right? Then, to complete the festivals, Sukkot is in the seventh month. As I mentioned, it's a time of harvesting. 
So Sukkot's celebrating the fall, and the Jewish people are bringing the harvest, and yet we go outside to show that we're not uh, secured by the roofs of our head, but by the sukkahs that we're living in for those days of the holiday. So those are how it's distributed, the first, third, and seventh month for the festivals. Now, what about the high holidays? Uh, Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur. So those are also in the seventh month. Rosh Hashanah is the first of that month. It's called Tishrei, the month. Yom Kippur is the tenth of the month. And then Sukkot, which is a seven-day holiday in the Torah, but eight days outside of Israel, begins on the 15th of the month. So if you look here, it's fascinating that Sukkot uh, actually is significant not only in the harvest cycle, the spring, summer, and then the fall when we harvest, but also concludes the high holiday period. And it's seen as a part of the set of the holidays. So you go through the intense accounting of what we, who we are, what we've done over the course of the year, as we prepare, we get the atonement from Yom Kippur, and then we celebrate a sense of completion and, and freshness. And, you know, in our, in our little incubator, the spiritual incubator of the sukkah, as we begin the new year fresh, so it's connected also to the high holidays in that sense. So those are the, the five holidays that are in the Torah first, third, and seventh month of the year. And Tishrei clearly is a month that's packed with holidays, blowing the shofar, fasting on Yom Kippur, and all the prayers, and the various holidays of the four species, um, commandments of the four species, and the going to the booths, and even more holidays, more mitzvot that are on that day. Then, in terms of the uh, holidays of Hanukkah and Purim, Hanukkah is in the ninth month. It says here the fall, I know you're probably thinking, it's the end of the beginning, usually December time, and Purim is in the 12th month of the year, which means Purim is always uh, in the month before Passover. It's the month before Passover. Hanukkah is in the ninth month. Then we have, in terms of the fast days, the siege, as I said, that began around Jerusalem by the Babylonians, the 10th of Tavis. This is usually January time. And again, it's a half-day fast. Then we have uh, the fourth month, the 17th time, that's when the walls were breached. And then in the fifth month, we have the ninth day of Av, when the temple is destroyed. Now, again, remember I mentioned that the ninth day of Av is a full-day fast. In our tradition, these two fast days are joined, and they create a period called the three weeks. During these three weeks, being that we're focusing on the walls being breached to the actual destruction, it's a time of really intense reflection and, uh, on what we've lost by not having a spiritual center of a temple, Jerusalem not being back in our homeland, and what we've lost over the course of uh, time and history. And, uh, and therefore, the three weeks are connected. We begin mourning practices. We don't shave. No well, uh, weddings are celebrated during this period of time. And so on. And then we get climaxes on the ninth day of Av, which is that full day fast. We read the Book of Lamentations, the Book of uh, Describes the Destruction of Jerusalem, and so on. So this is where we, it's, you've heard the three weeks. It's usually, it's always in the summer. That they, they occur. Then we have also the next is um, Lagba Omer. Now I didn't put this down as a holiday in the same way that we have biblical and rabbinic holidays. It's it's a customary day during the period from Passover to Shavuot. We have a period called Sfirata Omer, the counting the Omer. It's a fifty day period as we count in anticipation of going from Egypt to the foot of Mount Sinai to get the Torah on the thirty third day of the Omer period, the 33rd day after Passover, there's a celebration. Now, it happens to be that during this period of time, tragedies have occurred to the Jewish people. One of them was that Rabbi Akiva, one of the great sages of uh, the Jewish people that lived during the uh, post the, um, the Second Temple period, just when the Rome, uh, the temple had been uh, ruins, and um, just at that time, he had 24,000 students, and uh, he was a great sage, and the future of the Jewish people looked bright with so many people that are ready to lead spiritually. But there was a plague that struck, and uh, he lost 24,000 students during that plague. Tradition says they, they didn't treat each other pro, uh, with proper honor and respect, uh, which is critical to the foundation of the Jewish people in a sense of unity. And, uh, but one of his students... Uh, he ended up rebuilding with five students. One of his students, Rabbi Shimbar Yechai, was a great, uh, not a great sage, but also the one who's um, the author of the Zohar, the great mystical book of the Jewish people. So on this day, 
is the day that he passed away, but he revealed the Zohar, this mystical teaching to people. And he said, this would be a time of great splendor. And therefore on Lug Bomer, we have accustomed to build these bonfires to celebrate the light that burst forth through the life of Shem Bar Yechai. And it happened to be the day that the plague stopped happening to the Rebbe Kiva students. So that's Lag Omer. Then in the sixth month, there's no holiday in the sixth month. Remember, the sixth month is the month right before the high holidays. It's called Elul. And Elul, our tradition teaches that the letters of Elul in Hebrew stands for many things. One of them is the verse that states, Anila Dodi Dodi in the Song of Songs, I am for my beloved, my beloved is for me. Elul is an intense month of preparation for the high holidays, of kind of coming back to yourself, looking at where you've been over the course of the year and connecting the Almighty. Tradition teaches that during Elul, before God's coronation on Rosh Hashanah, where we proclaim him king, he's sort of going out to the fields and it's a time that we can really connect deeply. It's a very spiritually rich month and uh, an essential month in terms as we prepare for the holidays. So that's the sixth month. So every month you can see now, oh, excuse me, one more, the 15th of Shvat, Tuber Shvat, in Hebrew, Tezvav, the letters Tezvav, which can be pronounced two, means 15, uh, is where we celebrate the birthday of the trees. Um, it's a halachic uh, day in the sense that fruit that grows, uh, the day that new sap starts to enter the trees and fruit from that year that, that comes after the year is halachically distinguished from fruit from the previous year for certain uh, Jewish laws. But we celebrate that, uh, we mark it as Tu You've heard of it. Again, it's not a holiday in the way that the other holidays are celebrated, but it's a significant day. I just want to point it on the calendar. So if you look over here, every holiday, every month has something except for the eighth month, the month right after um, Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur and Sukkot. And it's actually called Mar Cheshvan. It's called Cheshvan, but it's also called Mar Cheshvan. Mar means bitter. Like we eat Maror, the bitter herb at Passover. It's a bitter month because we have no holiday in that month. It's the one that's the only month that's completely empty of any note, any, um, any mitzvah specific to mark an occasion. But tradition teaches that really after everything we've done in Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, and Sukkot, the ultimate test in life is who are you when you have nothing that's propelling you in a certain direction. So the Mark Hezvan is a month that really we get to implement everything that has been in our mind on Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, Sukkot, starting new, starting fresh. Well, you have a blank canvas in Mark Hezvan, the eighth month, to be able to uh, implement who you are and get accustomed to uh, better behaviors, stronger practices, and, uh, and stopping doing things that you shouldn't do. And that's the Mark Hezvan. So that's the Jewish calendar in a nutshell. So we've done a lot here. So just to review, we just we said the Jewish notion of time is dramatically different than other notions of time. Instead of um, instead of the Western notion where it's linear, and every every day is a new puff of existence that has no connection essentially or existentially to the past, our calendar is cyclical. It goes around, and therefore there's moments in that that cycle that we meet up again with, and that's when we have these touch points that are very deep and spiritual, and we access them by ceasing from doing work and taking on certain mitzvot, certain commandments that are essential that day. And that's why in Jewish law we say you prepare 30 days before a holiday because the preparation is really to get you geared to enter that, that point in time again that's so rich with spiritual energy, uh, as we said, pointed in different directions, freedom, revelation, happiness, and so on. Then we said that the, in terms of the calendars working, it's not lunar like the Muslims, it's not solar like the Christians, but rather it's a loony solar. We go by the months, but we adjust the, the lunar calendar to the solar calendar, so our holidays are there uh, expressed at the proper season. Because what's happening in the physical world is only a manifestation of really what spiritual realities that we're in. And therefore the ambience that's created by the seasons is essential to get in touch with what we're really trying to connect with deeply, which is the opportunity that happens during the holiday during that time. And then we went through the five biblical holidays and the uh, seven rabbinic, the five biblical split into two parts. You have on one hand, the three festivals that take us back in time, anchor us back to who we were, where we came from, so we don't lose sight of our, our roots and our purpose. And then with, that's Passover, Shavuot, and Sukkot. And then you have the high holidays, 
which prepare us for the future. We dig deep into who we, who we are individually, correct that, take accountability for it, be accountable for it, get the atonement, and start the new year as the Jewish people invigorated, fresh, and pure, so we can do what we're meant to do um, unencumbered by uh, past mistakes. And then we have the seven rabbinic holidays, five of them are fast days, three, um, two of them are celebrations, the five fast days divided into two parts, three of them for the temples, the siege, the breach of the walls, and eventually the destruction of both temples on the same day, the ninth mm-hmm. above, two fast days representing our experience in exile, that in Babylon, the fast of Gedalia, and the governor of the Jewish people at that time, or the fast of Esther. And then we have two celebrations, the rabbis pointed out, Purim and Hanukkah, Purim was a physical threat. Hanukkah, a spiritual threat. Uh, Purim was a hidden miracle. We saw God's hand protecting us, even though we're far away from the land of Israel. We're in exile in someone else's home, but God's orchestrating events to protect and preserve us. And then we have the open miracle of the Hanukkah light, which still burns bright every year. And to remind us that really, it's not our strength in numbers. It's really our strength in our connection to our tradition and the fact that our Torah provides all this light. So, as we say by every holiday, Hashanah HaBab Yishalayim next year in Jerusalem. Please God, all of us together celebrating, um, together uh, with a rebuilt temple and uh, with the light shining bright, not only to us, but the entire world that can come together, especially at this time. Um, everybody around the world, regardless of... Uh, skin color or other difference, we can come together and celebrate what we're all here to do and accomplish really as one uh, and, and to give this world the, uh, help this world realize the potential that God granted all of us to achieve. So Shana Bab Yishalayim. I'm Rabbi Avram Golder from golderschool.com. You can go to the site. I have videos and crash courses on the Torah, Jewish history, the holidays, our tradition. They're all free. They're all accessible. Tomorrow night, Mr. Shem, please God, I'll be back for the third in the series, which is the Crash Course on Spirituality, which we're going to build a framework to see how we approach spirituality in a big picture way. I think you'll find not only enlightening, but extremely practical to your day-to-day, and therefore very enriching. So this is Rabbi Avram Golda, Avram Golda from GoldarSchool.com. Thank you, Project Inspire. Have a wonderful night and all the best.